So I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our second speaker in our WAPA speaker series this year, Dr. Elizabeth Miasek. And I'm going to uh, read her bio and then give the floor to her to share her work with us. So Dr. Miasek has over 25 years of experience in health programming with a specialization in HIV program design and implementation, health strategy development, program mm -hmm. development, mm -hmm. integrated design, mm -hmm. prevention, effective team leadership, budget analysis and strategic analysis and strategic planning. Noteworthy highlights of her career encompass orchestrating the transition of a $400 million HIV portfolio from international to local partners, establishing community-led monitoring structures, and forging critical strategic partnerships for funding. Dr. Miasek's key priorities include data-driven decision-making, mentorship of teams, teams, and adept budget management, all geared towards ensuring successful program outcomes. Her work has predominantly spanned the African continent with a strong emphasis on localization and co-creation, consistently showcasing her ability to lead teams and develop impactful health programs across the program cycle. She has worked with esteemed organizations such as Health and Human Services, PEPFAR Department of State, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, USAID, and World Vision. In her most recent position as the Chief Operating Officer at the Kenya Women and Children Wellness Center, from October 2022 to August of 2023, her role involved providing strategic and technical direction to this newly established organization. Her responsibilities encompass defining the vision and mission of the center and cultivating crucial strategic partnerships for both funding and program implementation. Her unwavering support uh, and commitment to education and capacity building is further demonstrated by her experience as an adjunct professor, where she has had the privilege of teaching at institutions such as Hillsborough Community College in Tampa, Florida, uh, USF and GW. She holds a PhD in medical anthropology with a minor in public health, complemented by a master's degree in development anthropology. Her deep-seated dedication revolves around equipping the upcoming generation uh, of public health professionals with the knowledge and skills and essential to effective, positive change within the field. So I'd like to ask um, if everyone can help me in welcoming Dr. Miasek this evening. And her talk is entitled Cultural Dynamics in Health in the Health Outcomes and Exploration Through the Lens of HIV AIDS. Thank you, Dr. Miasek, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Courtney. I hope everyone can hear me. And it is my pleasure to be with you this evening. Thank you for inviting me to share with you my journey as uh, applied anthropologist uh, working in the field of HIV and AIDS. This journey actually started, uh, I did my undergraduate in Tampa, Florida, University of South Florida, working with uh, people like Dr. Wolf, or some of you may know them, uh, Linda Whiteford, Susan Greenbaum, uh, those were my, my mentors. And it is interesting that for me, my journey actually started uh, to, uh, to actually implement applied anthropology to help a program using cultural lens to make the program work. Uh, in a friend of mine did her internship at a hospital that was implementing immunization program. So when they started implementing this program in public housing, they would actually take all the services to the public uh, public housing, but nobody, nobody would come to be immunized on time. 
So they found that the resources they were putting into the program for community was not uh, really giving them what they wanted as a community program. When my friend did the internship, she suggested to them that they needed applied anthropologists with public health to help them figure out how to make the program work. So my first job was actually to see if anthropology can make a difference in public health. And so because I didn't know any better, I was just starting my PhD at the time. Uh, I just did the simple old anthropology where you actually go and spend time with people to understand them better to see how you can help them. Just the old concept where you go and build rapport with the people. And that's what I did. I spent time in public housing with the, with the people themselves and also with the leadership to help me understand what can we do better to make this work. It was just understanding people's behavior and how can understanding of that behavior help the program uh, to, be, to improve. And what I discovered is that uh, this program was being implemented when the public housing people had, had other priorities. They were taking the program to public housing when people were busy doing other things. They were actually watching soap opera. They were taking the program when they were busy watching their soap opera. So they were not interested in going to uh, make the program work. So I had to uh, reconfigure the program to fit with the people's priorities in this public housing and also to work with them, engage them so that they see this program as theirs and come up with ways to make this program work. So that is where my journey started in international health. These are just simple statistics. I've also shared this, um, just the latest statistics on HIV. We see that a lot of people have now been identified, but also treatment has gotten better. And we know that with uh, the implementation of PEPFAR in particular, we are seeing prevention is working and um, less and less people are continue to be infected, but more people are now getting treatment. If you look at this data, we are seeing that even though there are more, it seems like more people are living with HIV, but we know that People are now living longer, so of course there are more people living with HIV, and also the ways of identifying those who are positive has also been very effective due to the implementation of PEPFAR. New infections are actually going down, and also age-rated deaths have come down drastically. The burden of HIV is mainly and continue to be in the southern and also in the East Africa, but mainly in the south. If you look at the map where there are more uh, high prevalence, and also you find more people continue to be infected in South Africa, Mozambique, uh, Lesotho, Swaziland, Botswana, and then also moving into East Africa where also you find prevalence is going down very drastically. This data just show us that if you look at the data, there's still a big gap in the number of children who are actually accessing treatment. And that's an area that continues to be a challenge. And I think area that uh, future, uh, future professionals working in HIV need to come up with better strategy to ensure that children are receiving treatment and receiving treatment on time. Adults have done better because they can be reached and also strategies of reaching them have also been effective. But you find that in some cases, mother to baby pair is not working effectively as it should be. But part of the reason also is because the HIV program, when it was designed, was more clinical than community. It is through time that now people are realizing that you need to engage the community in the implementation of HIV program. And I think that will help put more children into treatment. This data is just saying exactly the same thing like the other one. Uh, even though there's a good number of uptake towards HIV treatment, we are still seeing more infection among the youth. That is mainly 15 to 24. That is where we are seeing a lot of new infection. And I think that's an area that's continuing to be a challenge. With the treatment, we find the youth 
I wouldn't say being careless, but they're being fearless because they know they can access treatment and they can live longer, but that is actually affecting uh, new, the number of new infection and where the direction where it is going. When we look at the socioeconomic uh, context in the African communities, wait just a second. You find the impact is the healthcare cost and also the health. The healthcare cost, the HIV impacted healthcare cost greatly because the systems were really drained. And these were systems that at the, from the beginning were not very strong to begin with. And also it affected people's health, longevity. Many people died early or continue to have multiple uh, diseases due to HIV because the HIV ruins the immunity of the body. In education, we found in African context, there were a lot of deaths of teachers. And also it affected students because there were the students who were sick could not go to school effectively, but also due to stigma, they were also not very comfortable being in school, especially in boarding schools where they had to take medication. That's a challenge we are still seeing up to today. It is also another area that I think there need to be new strategies, because even though teachers are trusted to help children take medication, sometimes they disclose the status of those children without their consent. So those are a few things that we are still grappling with in the HIV field. In the economy, we find productivity was affected. When people are sick, they cannot be as productive as they need to be. There was unemployment because some people did not want to hire those who are HIV positive. And also there was quite inequality between those who are affected and those who are infected. And that affected the economy in Africa as we could see. Society stigma still remain an issue up to today. Actually this week in, uh, in, in some countries, there was a big article saying how stigma is still alive. This is one area that the new generation working in HIV need to find ways to address stigma. Even though stigma has reduced drastically, so many people now are living with HIV and can talk about their status, but stigma continue to affect the way HIV is being treated, addressed, uh, drastically. And that's an area that I think need a lot of thinking, a lot of research. How can we address stigma moving forward? HIV also disrupted the fabric of culture. We ended up with uh, single parents, uh, single household, child-headed household, and there were, due to stigma, you find there were a lot of issues even within families, the way families interacted. I remember Early, early days, especially uh, I think around two, two or three when we went to uh, Botswana, where you'd find uh, where HIV infected people were kept in a room and were not allowed to eat with the rest of the family. So things have changed, but it has also affected the way that families interact with each other. So some challenges that we have faced in the HIV is HIV in Africa met very weak health systems. I remember in two or three, when we did the fact-finding visit, we visited three countries, Namibia, South Africa, and Botswana. We found a very weak system. Actually, you'll find um, pharmacies that the drugs were on the floor, Rats were living in the pharmacy. The, you find the, the storage, even just keeping files, were very, very poor. And this affected the way HIV was being implemented. PEPFAR has brought systems to grow and has helped systems to grow. Because even though PEPFAR was for HIV, when they helped uh, improve a system, the testing, the lab work, the storage, they did it for the whole hospital. So you find other areas like maternal and child health, malaria, they benefited 
from the strengthening of the system that HIV has, has, has brought. Also, at the beginning, there, were, there really was less staff that were equipped to do HIV treatment. And this was a big, big area. So one of the things that had to be done, especially the first 10 years of PEPFAR, was to ensure that systems were strengthened and also capacity was built for healthcare staff to be able to provide effective HIV care. Stigma and isolation, like I say, continue to remain a challenge. Even though it has improved, it continued to be a challenge. Uh, even though PEPFAR has provided a lot of resources, you find that due to the number of people on treatment, due to the number of systems that need to be maintained, uh, resources are not enough. And they still need to actually improve resources in many of the countries. Even in Kenya, where we find many facilities uh, like um, level two hospitals can now provide HIV care, but uh, some of them still do not have the full system developed to look at the whole circumference of HIV care, including data collection, storage, and also sharing of that data for programming. Cultural barriers continue to be an issue. Like I said, stigma continue to be there. And there are families that even though Right now, people are openly, and many people are open, but we still find cultural barriers. We still find inheritance of, uh, of, of spouses. Uh, inheritance in an African culture is where when a spouse dies, uh, they are inherited by either the relatives, even if they died from HIV. I remember in, uh, in Zambia, this was, this was a big issue because it is a society that strongly believed in that. And we had to work very hard with the community to address uh, inheritance differently. Zambia is a very chief-oriented society. Everything is ran and also managed by chiefs in the community. And so there's nothing you can do without going through the chiefs. So I had to build rapport with the chiefs, work with them so that we can address the issue of inheritance. So I remember there's this uh, one group in Livingstone where a chief that we had worked with, he had four wives. First of all, he had four wives and uh, we, had, we worked with him and he had all his family tested. He found he was HIV positive. They got on, he got on treatment, him and his family. So after he'd been on treatment, now I had to convince him to bring other chiefs together so that we can come up with how do we address this cultural barrier of inheritance. And I remember him doing a testimony with tears going down his, his eyes, telling the other chiefs that they have to save the society and they cannot continue doing what they, they used to do. And they sat down, discussed, and came up with a different way of fulfilling the, the, the need for inheritance without inheritance. And a, a, a inheritance required that the spouse being inherited had to meet and sleep with the other spouse. But they came with a way that they could spend the time without sleeping so that they can cut down the process of HIV infection. But because the community came with this idea themselves, they changed their culture. They came with a way to change it in a way that made sense to them and a way they could maintain. And even though those are small, small, small successes, but their successes that brought big changes when it comes to HIV uh, prevention. Another thing is a challenge is adherence to treatment. When in the early days, people used to take about 19 medications. Today, people can only take three. And uh, the way the science is going, people will be able to take one injection every three months. But even with that, we still find the biggest issue is adherence, where people do not take their drugs consistently and the way they need to take them. The requirement is if you are taking your medication at midnight, in, at midday, it needs to be at midday every time so that you adhere within the 24 hours. But in many cases, that doesn't happen. And this has been a challenge in every country that I've worked with, adherence to treatment actually is the biggest, biggest issue. And we had to work very hard here to bring in the community 
to help address adherence. Uh, th how do they remind each other to take medication? Some people, the buy uh, now that people have phones, they put an alarm on their phone to help them. But they have to have their phone with them at that time for it to work for them. So how do we work with the community to better remember? They have buddies. You have buddies that help you remember when to take your medication. So this is an area that needs a lot of research moving forward. And I think that understanding different behaviors can help us come up with how to improve the adherence because for treatment to work as prevention, it has to be done the right way. There's also poor program integration as a challenge. You find that within, even just within uh, USAID, uh, there's the health department, there's the agriculture department, there's the education department. When we go to the community, we are actually dealing with the same community, whether you are implementing agriculture, health, or education. But you find that these programs operate in isolation. And I think that is a big challenge. In Kenya, I tried very hard to integrate the way we implement programs. But even that, you find the, the head of those different departments, people are so uh, uh, territorial. They, they don't want to share, they, they, want, they want to have their areas so that they get, they get their own uh, recognition. And without understanding that actually the integration makes a lot more sense. If we are going to the same community where we are implementing agriculture, health, education, why don't we work together? It's the same, same people that we're dealing with the same family so that we give them a more comprehensive program than us doing different visits, different times, three times, uh, waste, wasting resources, visiting the same community at different times, even though we come from the same, the same organization. So I think that's another area that requires uh, some research on how to better integrate the programs. In Kenya, we tried as best as we could. And for, the, for those that agreed for integration, they've seen the benefits. And also, the, also, you bring resources together so that the community can benefit more than um, implementing programs in isolation. Supply chain is another one. Supply chain has come a long way. And um, uh, you keep hearing in HIV here and there, that supply chain can continue to remain a challenge, especially if not well planned. Medication that are going to be used six months uh, from now should have been ordered last year because of the way the supply chain works, uh, the production. Uh, when you bring supply, when you bring drugs into a country, the clearance, they are, this is such a long process that require a lot of planning. Uh, last, I think uh, two years ago, in Kenya, we went for almost uh, six months without test kits because test kits had disappeared. They were not ordered on time. And when you, all the mechanisms that have to go through to bring it in country, clearing through the port, working with the government, all that delayed. So it is an area that requires very good planning and thinking. Political and economic instability is also affecting uh, implementation of programs, especially in HIV in some countries, based on the support of the country, health departments or government do not want to fund health because they leave that for the donors. They don't want to be involved because they think the donors will do it. And sometimes they also use, they, they use that to try to twist the donors to provide more funding. But I think that PEPFA has done a great job in working with countries and putting their foot down that governments need to put more resources towards the development of their own health system and also to work together and not leave that for, for donors because they, 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 those on treatment belong to, the, to those countries, they don't belong to, they don't belong to, to the donors. Like I said, in an African context, we found that with HIV brought large, large number of orphans and also child-headed uh, households. In one community, in some communities like in Nyanza, you, you'd find and you find communities, adults were almost white. You find just children running households and children growing up very fast because you find 
Even the next neighbor, you find their children, the adults there also have died. And that really affected the stability um, of the country. Cultural practices that I've talked about, are several that looks at different things. And also some of them look at, you know, even just the food that you eat sometimes affects the way that the medication reacts in your body. And all those cultural practices, the better people to understand them from where I sit is those who understand human behavior and cultural behavior. And I think what has helped me in understanding and also implementing programs that are effective is because when I go to a community, I first understand their cultural behavior because that's the way anthropology has wired my brain. I want to understand people's behavior proximity and then bring in the health aspect of it and also the treatment. I don't think clinical first because I'm not a clinical person. I first think what, what, what is going on here? What are people doing and how can what they're doing help improve the health? Poor systems. I cannot. Yeah, poor system was was also an issue, like we've talked about. And when I talk about poor system, I'm talking about the whole, whole, whole system. Uh, I've traveled in a lot of hospitals, uh, both in Zambia. Zambia, I traveled the whole country up and down. Same thing with Uganda and the same thing with Kenya. Because for me to better understand how to serve the people, I need to see and know their environment and what they do on a daily basis. And you find that the, the systems are very key in terms of delivery. You may, have, uh, you may have the drugs, but if you don't have a system to administer those drugs, if you don't have uh, trained staff who understand what they're doing, then your program will not be as effective as you want it to be. So putting system together was one, a big, big part of what we did in HIV. And sometimes you found poor roads. I remember in Kenya, there's a, 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 a county called Trukana, where there are even no roads. We are driving on riverbeds, the dry riverbed, so that we can get to the facilities, to the hospitals. And during the rainy season, like, like, like now when it is raining, you, you can't even access uh, those hospitals, meaning people cannot get their treatment on time. So those are the challenges. And in Trukana, you can't even, the, the, the environment there, you can't even build roads. It is very dry and it is so hot and it is full of sand, completely sand. So you have to think of a different way on how to make programs work there. In a place like Turkana, when I visited uh, and, and I worked with the people there, understood with, uh, what they were doing, I had to bring the community together and say, how can we help you so that you come with a program that works for you. So in, in, in Trukana, you find most of the, uh, in rural areas, the health HIV is being delivered by the community. So instead of being more clinical oriented, we developed a more community oriented uh, program. They are also nomadic, they move, they are, they, 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 they are cattle hustlers. So they are not in one place. Where you leave them today is not where you're going to find them. So you cannot think of a, sta of, of a static clinic to be able to be effective in what you do. So you have to work with those uh, cattle hustlers, the boys, and train them to be able to be the, those who are delivering the medication in their own communities. So that was um, understanding where people are so that you can meet them, but also working with them so that they can be engaged in delivery and also receiving the treatments that they need. So the, today I can say that PEPFA has really helped improve the infrastructure for data collection. Uh, 20 years ago, we didn't have the system. So even getting good data to inform programming was not there. And for you to understand the direction where things need to go, you need to understand what does the data look like? What is the data telling me? In this area, who is infected? Who is being infected? Are they women? Are they men? At what age uh, are, they, are, are, are they being affected? So that you know how to direct the interventions to be effective and also to be able to uh, make sure that the interventions 
are geared towards meeting the needs and following the data to then you can tell am i improving in what i'm doing or am i not improving so uh, right now i think pepfar has really improved the, the data collection system um, and right now they they, they have actually um, an open source where you can access data from all pepfar countries that anybody can access but that has come a long way it was not like that uh, 10 years ago or 20 years ago and even the the, the systems the system that were there, the the, the, com the computers that are, that were there were not as many. Now they are. The issue that still remains is that um, you find in many countries the, the 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 data is not connected. Like you find um, each hospital may collect their data, but you don't find the hospitals connected. So that if a patient is moving from uh, uh, clinic A to clinic B, you can track them. And I think that's now an area that they are working on moving to the future, that how can you be able to track a patient that move around so that you know they're the same patient, this is where they got their medication. And I think that will be a big breakthrough when they, in a country they can be able to track a patient uh, throughout the system in that country. In Kenya, I think only in Western where they've tried to improve that system, but, um, Right now, the the whole country is not completely uh, connected where you can follow somebody completely. Now, some of the successes that has come through, for example, when we went when I went to Zambia in two thousand and six, they didn't even have a prevention strategy, and we drafted. By then, I was working with the um, Center for Disease Control, and I worked with the team, and we drafted them the first prevention strategy for five years to be able to direct so that we were implementing a program that was structured, that had a timeline, and also that had measurable milestones that can be tracked. Um, also, we I, I initiated a joint program monitoring. Like I say, that um, you find even within um, a department that People are so disjointed. Everybody wants to do their own things. I came up with a strategy where if we were going to visit a program, we you go as a team. You take the clinician, you take the program person, you take the program manager, you also take the measurement ME person. So that when you go to visit a partner, you look at all those together and also you take the, the budget person and you sit and you discuss a program as a whole. You don't go as the measurement evaluation person go by themselves, the doctor go by themselves, and then you find the program person go by themselves. And I remember the deputy saying that when I was leaving, that you are the best project officer we've ever had, but it is because of the way I, I looked at programming and the way I, I brought a system for monitoring program in, in a more holistic way, and they could able to see the, the difference in how the programs were being implemented. Uh, actually, because of that, there's a, a partner where we were doing testing and the target was to test uh, 7,000 um, 7, people in that year. I think they ended up doing 21,000 just because of the way we integrated the program. I also started the first prevention for LGBTIQ in Zambia for the first time. It was very difficult because there was a lot of stigma. There was a lot of stigma. But the director, uh, uh, Dr. Buteres, was very, very encouraging. encouraging. I, I remember even when we were meeting, we, we had to, to meet in a very hidden place because nobody wanted to even see or hear or listen to doing any programming for LGBTI. But right now, we included them in the prevention strategy and the program is running strong. So those are a few things that I'm proud of having done. Uganda, we did DREAMS is a, is a youth program that's uh, mainly dealing with prevention for young girls. Because um, I think the data started showing that there was high infection among youth, young girls especially because they were being infected by older people. So a program called uh, DREAMS 
was brought to help these girls to be determined, resilient, uh, so that they can protect themselves from infection. And Uganda was the first program to show that DREAMS was working, but of course the way we designed it, the way we designed the, the program was purely based on data. We could track uh, the success. And I think after two years, when the evaluation was done, it was found to be one of the best programs and, and I was able to show PEPFA that DREAMS was an effective program and can work. In Kenya, I implemented what is called the SAG strategy. This was uh, an intensive strategy working with the community, removing HIV from the clinic to the community. Uh, meeting with community, understanding where they were coming from, so that they can be part of the identification. How can community be part of helping identify who else is infected and those who are infected, are they taking their medication? Now, when I came to Kenya uh, in 20, 2018, uh, the team the team that I was leading, I had a team of about 30. Um, half of them were physicians, were doctors, and half of them were program people. They, they were identifying new infection at a percentage of 1.4. Uh, that's how we measure identification, 1.4. So they convinced me that they've done everything that they think is possible and they, they, they cannot find any new, they, uh, they cannot identify any new people who are infected. The, the identification rate was only at 1.4. And I told them, no, I don't believe that. We need to do something different. So when we implemented the intensive identification strategy, working with the community, engaging and going to the field and just understanding what was going on, the identification within six months had gone up from 1.4 to 3.5. In some cases, it was as high as 35. And, and when they saw that the, the, uh, this was really working and it was different, we've never gotten 1.4 anymore. It is always now higher than 1.4 because they've come up with a different strategy of identifying new infection. Now, reaching the last mile is going to be tricky. You have to be very resourceful. You have to, you have to do things differently. You cannot keep doing the same thing and expect a different answer. And the SAG intensive strategy really showed Kenya that things can be done differently and they can work. In Kenya also, um, localization has become a word that you hear in the development world, but actually Kenya led the transition from international to local partners. And Kenya had the largest number of um, international, uh, uh, international moving to local partners than any other country. So the very first uh, presentations or sharing of what was going on or how to structure localization was actually led by us. And I did those presentations. Right now, many countries have also picked up and they're moving in that direction. It took a lot of work. I had a very good team and uh, we sat down and came up with a very thorough planned process on how we are going to transition. Um, we drafted it, we came up with a plan, we came up with a timeline, we came up with who was going to do what. And I made sure that I was at the forefront of whatever was happening. I, I, di I didn't ask my team to do anything that I cannot do myself. So we did this together and it made it easy. So when I hear localization out there, some people don't understand where it came from, but Kenya actually led the process of localization. So some lessons that we have learned through the time, like I've said for me, community engagement. You cannot do development without engaging community. The good old anthropology, going to understand people, engaging people, giving the opportunity to speak for themselves has been very, very critical moving forward. And it, 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 it works, it worked then, it is working now, and I won't do it any other way. Uh, building rapport, like we know good old anthropology and leveraging local knowledge, like I've shared with you. For me, it has been understanding of local, that local knowledge that have made a difference in the work that I have done uh, compared to any other public health person. 
uh, also making sure that there's collaboration uh, between the departments. It is tough because like I told you, people want to keep their money. They think if you are going to collaborate, now you have to share the money, but actually uh, good, you are, you are stronger in numbers. When we did localization, we also did co-creation. Co-creation is when partners designed programs, I made sure that those programs were designed with the community. If it was going to be for maternal and child health, that they, they were co-created with the county leadership, with the women themselves, the beneficiaries were part of how that program was being designed. And I think for the first time in Kenya, the, the community said they can feel, appreciate what the USAID was doing because they were part of the process. They understood how the program was being designed. They understood how it was being implemented. They were part of the implementation. They were part of the monitoring because this was their program and they really appreciated that. Co-creation, I also created a very structured process for co-creation. I remember the first, co uh, when we did the first co-creation, I didn't attend that one, my staff did. So when she came and reported, oh, we've done co-creation, I said, what did you guys do? So she walked me through what they did. So I asked her what the beneficiary part of that process. He said, no, uh, we didn't, but we are going to bring them in next time. I said, no, you have to do it again. You cannot design a program for people without them being there. If we're going to do things differently, we have to be serious about it. They had to go and repeat the process. I'm sure they didn't like it, but the program they came up with is working very well now because the community was part of that process. System strengthening, uh, ensuring that the systems are strong, like I've, we've mentioned before, for you to deliver, you need a strong system and you need an effective system, but you have to put that system in place. Uh, talked about community involvement in Zambia, the data collection project. We In, in Zambia, we were implementing a program where we were trying to test um, we are trying to test uh, a concept, the radio drama, if radio drama can help bring prevention. And so we had to walk in the country uh, collecting data. Zambia, like I told you, is a very chief oriented um, community. So I, what I did is make sure these chiefs were very, very involved in the process. And when we were doing testing, when you when you when you when you take blood, they some of the community members thought we were blood suckers, so they became very very um, aggressive towards the data those who are collecting the data. But because I had worked with the chiefs and the chiefs were part of the data collection themselves, they made sure that the community did exactly what needed to be done. But the chiefs would also organize the community. One chief would tell us, in the morning people are going to the farm. You come here from twelve and I will have the whole community here. And they would have the community there because they understood and they were part of the process. So community engagement can do a lot for you. They can make the work very easy in the implementation. You just have to let them know that they matter and they are part of the program. The same thing with the, the DREAMS program in Northern Uganda, we engage the youth, we engage the community and the stories that they told us um, and the, out, the outcome of the program is, uh, is was rewarding when you go and find the you find the youth have organized themselves to come up with economic development just because they understand they understood the concept and they want to test it. I already sub talked about system in place, localization in Kenya, co-creation process. These are things that have worked very well and served very very well, um, and also produced good results. Uh, I already talked about the SAGE strategy. And the, when I brought the SAGE strategy, I really had to persuade the director that this was going to work. After they convinced themselves that they can only do identification of 1.4, I had to persuade the director because he was like, has this ever been done before? Uh, where's the data? I said, there's no data, but please allow me Give me three months. If it doesn't work, I will drop it. But give me three months to do things differently and engage the community to see. And within three months, we were seeing results. As a leader, 
I've got the opportunity to really mentor, especially through the side, really do mentorship. Because when I introduced a new concept, I brought somebody from Uganda who I was working with there to come and help me um, uh, build capacity of the staff here so that uh, in Kenya, so that they can understand the concept and also help them understand how this worked. Being flexible has been very, very important because if you are trying new things, you have to be open to making mistakes. You have to be open to change. You have to be open to learning. And you also have to be open to doing things uh, differently. Like I say, I lead by example. I don't tell my staff to do something that I can't do myself. If they are going to the field, I'm the first one to go with them. And I move from one county to the next. When I, when I send out a team of five to different parts of the country, in a week, I make sure I've visited every team. I've seen me and they know that I'm there with them and I'm supporting them and I'm also doing exactly what they are doing. So uh, we use mistakes as opportunity for, for learning and not for everybody make mistakes, but what are the lessons that we learn from them so that we do uh, things differently. As a leader, my door is always open, but I'm also very strict when it comes to outcome. Uh, I don't want us to waste our time, waste money, and say, we've done this, we've spent the money, but we have nothing to show for it. We have to have, we have to have, uh, we have to have results. And if we cannot have results, we need to find what do we need to do differently and how do we do it different? Because there's always a different way of doing things. Brainstorming with the team. I met with my team every morning during planning. We met every single morning and we went over what we we're going to do for the day, for the week. When we're in the field, we we're talking every day in the evening. What did you guys find? What are the challenges? What can we do differently? It's a lot of work, but it does work. And my team has actually learned that understanding culture is very important you know, when it comes to health delivery. Even physicians, doctors who just believed in treatment now know that you just don't do treatment. You need to find, you need to understand people, you need to engage them, and you need to see programs. You cannot get results by sitting in the office. You have to visit and know what's going on. If you if you give people a system, are they really using the system? Is it working for them? If it is not, what is the issue? You cannot know that if you are not there and doing it. Now, building partnership, the BYC Minus program in, 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 in Florida gave me the sound foundation on how to do programming. Now, this is the program that I, I was the one that I was told make the program work. It was an immunization program. It was not a HIV program. But this program showed me what was key critical, understanding people, uh, making sure that you collaborate with people, making sure that you engage the community and make the project work. By the time I was leaving, the, over the summer, there are times we could immunize 500 children within three days. And when they started, sometimes they couldn't even immunize 20 because people were not coming. But within the seven years that I was there, over the summer when we were preparing children to go to school, we could even immunize 500 in three days. And that meant a lot of planning and uh, involving uh, several other communities, hospitals. Uh, I think I had even, even, the, even the, the TV stations actually became partners because they now are advertising for us for free. I would just fax and say we are doing this and they're the ones who will advertise for us. I didn't even have to do the, the, the advertisement on my, myself. So already talked about capacity building. So the, uh, the HIV and development work has good opportunity for future research. And I hope that, that the students that are going, that are upcoming uh, really take advantage of these opportunities to look at these programs like DREAMS program. There's a lot of opportunity there for research to improve it. The uh, Orphans and Vulnerable Children program, localization is new, just coming. The thing with the localization is that it is so broad and the, is it working, is it not working? It, it, for localization is a whole different, uh, a whole different um, uh, lecture that I would like to do at another time because there are so many things there in it. It is easier as yes, we move from international to local partners. 
but really how is it working? And there's a lot in there that we can engage in and there's a good, quite a good opportunity for research. So for me, the next step is I would like to, uh, to see the, the new set of applied anthropologies benefit from some of this uh, trial by error that we have done, some of this learning that I've had through these years. How can I make sure that this, this experience is shared with uh, those who are coming after us? So my plan is I hope to do some writing now that um, we have some time and also to get opportunity to, to do a little bit of teaching so that some of this experience can help ground our next set of applied anthropologies so that they don't uh, uh, do uh, trial by error like some of us did, but they take some of the lessons that we have learned and polish it and take it to another level. You already talked about this. So I will open it up for any Wonderful. questions. Thank you so much. Um, can we all thank Dr. Miasek for that wonderful talk um, and sharing her work with us this evening. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, so we can open it up for um, Q&A and discussion. Um, please feel free to unmute yourself. It can be much more like a conversation. Also, absolutely welcome to use the chat as well, and I can read it out, whatever is better for um, for everyone. And Dr. Miasek, thank you again for sharing all of your work with us this evening. Um, so we can open up the floor. Um, yes, Emily, please go uh, ahead. I just want to thank you for an absolutely superb presentation. And I encourage you to use those main topics and others that you think of and include them in a book. Because what you have spoken about, I know from my own experience, works very well. And I really am proud of you because you developed those activities, you took initiative, and you led groups uh, forward in culturally appropriate ways. So I strongly encourage you to write it up as a book. If you Thank wish, you. buy a book, but it's very, very important. I do have a little suggestion for you, and it's that very difficult area of multisectoral work, working across sectors or across uh, institutions of government, uh, agencies, whatever it is that you're doing, where different types of activities, in addition to HIV and health, are being done. You are right that great a lot more could be done if you were to work successfully, you and others were able to work successfully across sectorals, sectoral areas. Uh, we use in work that I do a transdisciplinary approach, which I would be happy to describe to you at some point, but I don't want to bore everybody else with it. But there are ways to do that at every level, local and community. Uh, municipal, if it's the government of the municipality is included, regional levels, and of course, at national levels. And there are many, quote, secrets, unquote, of how to do that successfully. And um, I just would love to, to visit with you at some point to talk about what could be done, because I agree with you. Every time you bring together several different in essential services, in local uh, communities, in communities, you will find you get a multiplication of impact mm -hmm. and even more could be done. But what you have done is phenomenal and superb. So it would just be something for the future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Emily. I appreciate it. And I will reach out to you so that um, yeah. I can learn more. And I, and I can learn from you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Wonderful. Go ahead, Mark, please. Yeah. Hi. Um, yeah. Just let me uh, reinforce. Um, that's an amazing amount of work that you've that you've done with with a, an incredible degree of success. So, you know, all kudos to you for for all that work and and the suggestion of sharing that in a book and podcasts and other you know formats. I think would just in terms of sharing that with other applied anthropologists would be great. Um, I had one comment and one question. Um, 
just on the, you know, uh, again, in, in, in my experience doing community collaborative projects, I mean, one of the things you, you were talking about bringing the M&E folks along with you, which I think is really important because um, it's, you know, any applied anthropologist knows this, but like for students particularly, it's very, it's, it's messy stuff, you know, and having the M&E people that are, are, you know, participate in that collaborative process is really important because the goals change, the steps along the way change, the, the mediators and moderators may change. All those things are going to change um, when, you know, you're engaged in that process and find out, you know, that no, the step you thought that would achieve X is not going to achieve X. You need, you know, Y, P, Q, and D. And that mm -hmm. has to be added in with your M&E stuff. So, you know, it's, it's great that you're you're doing that. Um, the question I had was just in terms of the stigma, which came up a number of times. And I was just wondering if you could just talk a little bit about, um, you know, what, what kinds of stigma you were running across, because this has been such an issue with HIV since the beginning. And um, just, you know, over time, it's, it's probably taken different directions or focused in certain areas and just, you know, any, any thoughts you had about the stigma issue that you to run across? Um, stigma actually is at uh, different levels. There, there's still um, self-stigma that people who still um, feel they don't want to be known, they don't want to come out, they don't want to go and get their, their drugs. But there's also stigma that you find also from uh, providers, from healthcare workers who still you find project and treat those who are HIV positive are differently. You find um, other diseases, diabetes, they'll, they'll be very okay. But when it comes to uh, HIV, they, you find some, some healthcare workers still behave differently. Uh, the, the facilities, there are some facilities, just the way the facility organize themselves, where they have the HIV in that corner. So everybody, know that that is the HIV corner. We try to integrate as much as possible so that um, people who are going to get their treatment do not feel that they have to hide. There are cases where people have to walk around to get to be, just because they don't want to be seen or what are people going to say or how are they going to, to, to take, and some people still don't want to even openly, openly talk. So I talked with uh, with counselors and I told even providers that you, you can decide what kind of provider you want to be. You can be a provider where people feel open to talk to you. They can call you because they feel comfortable and the way you treat them. So and what I tell people is put yourself right now. There's, in, in Africa, almost everybody knows somebody in the family who is HIV positive or somebody or a friend. So... Nobody can pretend that they don't know, but it is you who decide which kind of provider you are going to be. And I try to encourage, encourage providers that if people cannot seek treatment from you because they don't feel comfortable, then I think you are not, you are, you, this is not the kind of job that you need to, you need to be working in a different department because HIV is already a burden and it is already stigmatized. So you don't want to be, uh, add that stigma again on somebody else and also not spending time to understand your patients where they are so that they can meet you halfway and make sure that they take their drugs the way they need to do. So it is, when you look at Sigma, it's very broad. It's, it's um, self is still, and there are family members also who are still very stigmatized. Um, right now, you people eat together, so that has actually reduced completely. And many people are healthy. You wouldn't even know uh, people are positive now because of medication. People are very healthy and doing very, very well. So that has cut some of that stigma. But it is still there in communities. You still find people are still gossiping. So and so. And they've given the, the HIV drugs different names that they that they used to, to call it, just because uh, the people are stigmatized. But it is an area that I think as anthropologists, we need to put some serious effort. Uh, in terms of research to understand in different communities what what is still left there with stigma and how do we can we how can we just help jump a little bit 
of that to improve it. Because medication is there and it is getting much, much better. Thank you. Hmm. There's a question in the chat that I will go ahead and read. Um, thank you for your work. How do we engage with newer professional anthropologists so that they continue to learn about what has been done? Now that is my that is my next challenge. How do we how do we do that? Um, uh, we need to um, write, do presentations, uh, share our work, find find ways to also share it quickly and broadly. A book may take time. Uh, writing articles like um, in in journals so that um, this information is accessible to people and they are able to use it and use it well. Uh, if you if you are working in public health as an anthropologist at the beginning, I used to wonder, fear or wonder um, will will anthropology really make a difference? And if you are with other health professionals and they hear you are an anthropologist, they were like, hmm, they think public health. But for me, the combination between public health and anthropology is what has really, really been, been, been key. So we need to find ways to let them know this is working, it can work. Actually, in, in, in the University of South Florida, because of the effort that we were very, I was very interested in anthropology and also in public health, uh, made uh, Linda Whiteford actually there's now a combined course in masters where you can get masters in, in anthropology and public health at the University of South Florida, just because of that interest. So we want our new upcoming anthropologists, practicing anthropologists to know this. So me, I'll do whatever is possible, whatever it will take, whether it's writing, sharing, uh, any forums that we can do this so that this information is out there and is being useful and people know the value of anthropology in public health. Thank you so much. Does anyone else have? I'll ask. I'll ask a question while people maybe are are thinking of one. Um, so I I'm just so thankful that we have dedicated people who are very interested in mentoring and education and and kind of training the the next generations. And I think in that aspect, if there's something, a piece of advice that you could give to young professionals, to recent graduates as they are starting off their career um, and, and might be interested in global health, public health developments, what would you tell them? I would tell them that whatever the area they are going in, even in agriculture, even in education, to make sure that the understanding of environment proximity and the understanding of cultural and human behavior is key to what they're doing. If you're working with, with farmers to improve, uh, um, to improve food security, to be able to understand where are these farmers coming from, what is available to them and engage them, engage them, let them be part of the development that you want to do for them. Let them help you through the thinking. And I found that to be very, very useful. People will educate you in a way that you don't know. Half of what I've learned, I've learned from the people that I worked with. I got some from school, but really learning to do development well is through engaging with the, the, with the community. So, uh, and if they're working with other professionals, just let them know that, <laughs> You you can do a better job. Show them you can do a better job because of your because of your cultural understanding. Because you will. Yeah. You will. Thank you. Thank you very much. Because now with, with with HIV, they are now moving uh, from the, the the focus was so much clinical, and people were fighting. They are grappling. Why is this not working? Why are we not finding the people? Because you are in the clinic, people are in the community. You are not bringing the two together. So now they are bringing the two together, bring the clinical and the community together. Where they, they call it community, we call it community something. Where they even, you, you take a, a treatment into the community itself through 
uh, doing community, instead of people going to the clinic, you go to the community and do uh, community outreach and provide treatment out there. In, in Trukana, that's what we developed and it worked. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do we have any additional questions before we wrap up our talk this evening or comments? Make sure. Okay, well, we would like to, again to thank you for sharing your work with us. I think we've all learned quite a lot <laughs> this evening and are very appreciative um, of you being with us. And we hope that you um, will also stay involved in WAPA and that we get to see you at future events as well. Yes, I just joined WAPA, so um, I joined back as a member. So, <laughs> yes. Wonderful. So I'm, I'm getting all the messages that are going to WAPA members as well. Yes. I oh, and great. bring your friends, bring more in. Yes. I will. Yes. <laughs> I will. Well, I will put a, a, a kind of just to put on your radar, our next event will be after the new year. We'll actually probably have um uh we have we'll have a talk on filmmaking um in January. And then um also I believe we will be hosting uh Napa afterwards in February. Um and we are also planning a kind of winter party, so maybe a happy hour networking event that also will take place. So please um stay tuned for for further events. That will be great. And thank you so much to you all. Thank you and have a great evening. Thank you. Thank Courtney. you. Thank you for thank listening you. to me and for the opportunity. Thank